Hello, RC. I am Pastor Kevin. I'm here with Bishop Burton. And uh, look, we're just here to have a conversation. And uh, just for some context, you know, uh, Bishop and I, we talk uh, at least once a week. Yes, we and, do. And uh, we have some really interesting and, and insightful conversations. And I think from time to time, you know, at least for me, and I'm sure for you as well, when we have a conversation, we'd say, you know what, this would be this would be a great idea for like a podcast, you know? So, yeah. So basically what we're doing is we're going to just, you know, let you in on our conversation. Uh, and, and, and we want to talk about just uh, some of the history in the 21 years you've been pastoring, where we've come from, where we are today and where we're, where right, we're going. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you've been certainly a, a, a great part of that because you were born and raised here, right? Yes. Yes. Born yeah. and raised here. And, um, you know. I mean, actually born and raised here in this church, not yes. just in yes. Canada or in Quebec, yes. but in this church. Yes, in this congregation. And uh, your parents are still part of our congregation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you, you and First Lady have been pastoring for 21 years. So let's go back to, let's go back to the beginning. We've been pastoring here 21 years. Yeah. We've been pastoring yeah. yes. more years than that because we were pastoring before we came yes. here. Yes, yes. So, well, so maybe talk a bit about that. What, what was, what was your, your pastoral experience prior to coming to RC? Well, I've always been involved in ministry, as most people would know. My wife grew up in a, as a PK, so her, yeah. her dad and mom was in ministry uh, all their lives. And my wife, I think, was her first sermon she ever preached. She was five years old. And, and I, yeah, maybe something like that. Very young, anyway, even if okay. it was a five. Um, it was, she was very young. And some, maybe it was eight. And somebody actually gave their heart to the Lord in her in her sermon, wow. but you know, so she's been involved in ministry all of her life. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home, not involved in ministry uh, officially, mm -hmm. but even as a young boy, I was a soul winner, mm -hmm. and I would I would witness a lot to uh, to my friends or people that I knew. Mm -hmm. So you know, back in. The old church when I was yeah. growing up, um, we would invite people to the altar. We don't do that much anymore where, you know, somebody will feel like, hey, there's somebody in the back that don't know Christ. You go talk to them and invite them to come to the altar to receive Christ. That was me as a, okay. as a young boy. Uh, Did someone ins like instruct you to do that or this was just instinctive? It or? was instinctive, I think. Uh, yeah. It was, I've, I had a heart for for souls and people that were lost. Okay. Uh, so, and I'm talking young, like, you know, 10, 11, 12, you know, I began officially like in, in ministry as a minister. I think it was 19 when I, when I first started getting involved in youth pastor, as, as youth ministry, I should yeah. say. But I mean, I grew up in church. Okay. So, okay. You know, I know the good, the bad, and the ugly <laughs> of, of church. Right. And not everything that happens in church is, is good, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of bad things can happen because wherever there's people, there's brokenness, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, long time. Uh, and we've been here for 21 years. Can't believe it. It, it, still, it still seems like we just got here. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's a huge testimony to the people that God allows us to pastor and to work with, yeah. it's because of people like you why we have stayed 21 Amen. years. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, when we had we had a conversation like this last year when we celebrated your, uh, you and First Lady's 20th anniversary pastoring RC. Right. And one of the questions I asked, you know, for those those of you who missed it, was, you know, studies show that pastors don't tend to stay very long. At yeah. Church, Two know? years. Yeah, three, three four years. years is huge. Yeah. If you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So twenty now, twenty one years is is is, you know, is, is significant. You know, so what would you attribute that to? What what's what's made it that you and First Lady have have been able to last so long? And I know it's going to be even longer than that. But uh, what yeah, would you attribute that to? well, we're definitely not bored, yeah. um, and we certainly don't feel like God has done. Yeah. And over the years, Kevin, there's been opportunities to leave. And I mean opportunities as different offers. Yeah. People will yeah. say, you know, can, would you consider this or that or something else? Yeah. So, uh, 
Uh, I believe that there's, there's no one simple answer to, to the reason why we sure. stayed. Sure. Uh, but if, if you were going to ask me the single most important reason or the most reason why we stayed, and I, I understand that people that don't know us probably would think that this is a padded or a fake answer, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not. It's the truth. Right. And the only way anybody could stay anywhere for 21 years serving people, loving people, empowering people, is because of the people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, if I could just clarify, can I, can I do that? Yeah, absolutely. Some people will say, oh, it's because of God. I would disagree. Yeah. Ultimately, God is in control of everything. But God gives people a free will. People have choices. Or, yeah. Correct. People have choices, right? So the only reason we could last is not if it's God's will or not. The only reason why we could last is because of the people that God has surrounded us with over the years. And understand, all the people we started out with, some of them are no longer with us. Yeah. But they still played such an important part of our lives. And Even if it was just for a period even if it was just for a period some of the you know some of the the elders or the board depends on what you would call yeah. uh, that started out with us that was key in getting us to come here yeah. uh, they didn't stay with us okay so but these some of these people all of these people are incredibly incredibly gifted people and they are uh, key reasons for us not to just be here, but the reason why we stayed. Mm -hmm. Because in, the, in those moments, they loved us, cared for us, and I believe still do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But some relationships are not long-term relationships. I, I really believe in, in not all relationships are seasonal. But I do believe that there are, God will bring certain people into your life for certain seasons. Mm -hmm. And when that season is done, it's not that you don't speak to them anymore, that you know you had a problem. It's just life changes yeah. us. That season is, is, is up. Correct. It's like uh, we, went to, uh, we went to a leadership conference about 15 years ago. And I remember T.D. Jakes, it was a T.D. Jakes leadership conference. Okay. He talked about, he used the analogy of scaffolding. Yes, you know, yes, yes. And you put up scaffolding, but scaffolding is never intended to be a, a permanent permanent yes. thing. You know, you use it there for temporary until what's being built is finished, and then and then you take it down. So I, I do see that yeah. for certain people where they're there for right. a season, and it doesn't mean that there's a fallout or there's sin or anything. But that's it, correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so the, the the quick and the simple answer is it's really our people. Yeah, uh, and that doesn't mean that that I've always, that they always like the decisions I made. Yeah. I don't always like our people's behaviors, yeah. Yeah. but being called to a people rather than a, just appointed by a man to a people, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's huge. Right. And I, Glennis and I speak for both of us, but we feel called mm -hmm. to this people. Yeah. Not to a location. Yeah. It's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. What this is the location is not the people that we're called to. Yeah. We're called to the to the people and this can move. We can move yeah. anywhere. As you yeah. know over the years, we've moved a lot. Yeah. Remember back in the day when we couldn't find a building, yes. people would say, Hey, the resurrection center is a great place to go if you can find them. <laughs> 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 because we would move from one place to the next school place to school. Yes. Oh man, yes. we don't we don't regret that. I remember the days you had to go there like six o'clock in the morning, set up, doing the set up, pulling out speakers. Yeah. Even the organ guys, even the organ, like we had to move the organ, yeah. all the, on a the keys, with wheels to yeah, roll yeah. it out, and keep. I mean, uh, the sound board, this huge, massive yeah. board. It's not like these little digital boards we had today. Brother Louie was so so faithful and yes. and then we yes. do two services right yeah. remember two yeah. services so then we would have to stay after the service yeah. to to clean up take everything down hey Put it away. thank you jesus <laughs> for for 
for coming through for us and giving us this incredible yeah. building. Yeah. Because even with all the difficulties of having an older building, this mm -hmm. building is such a gift from God. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. So I want to I want to go back to to the beginning of pastoring here at RC, formerly called Montreal West Church of God, now Resurrection Center. You're starting out yes. pastoring a new church 21 years ago. Yes. If you could give that Bishop Burton hey. advice, yes. what, would, what would it be? Or you could even look at it like someone who is starting ministry now, you know? I got it. Yeah? Yes. This is what I would tell the 21-year-old or go back 21-year-old to 21 years ago to Dave. I would tell Dave, I would tell him this. Make your wife priority number one okay. after God. Okay. Because I've not always done that. Right. Right. So n now I, I think I, I'm, I'm doing a better job. Well, she, she didn't leave me. <laughs> so, so I must be doing a better job because yeah. I think if I look back over my life, I think I probably have given her plenty of reasons to leave. And, and it's not because I was immoral. Do you understand that? Because yeah. a lot of times people think, oh, he must have cheated on her to make statements like, I yeah. never I never cheated on my wife with another woman other yeah. than the bride called the church. Right. I cheated on my wife with the church because my church, the church at times in my life was the priority yeah. and not my wife. Yeah. It's God first, our family, and I believe family would be my wife a second, even, mm -hmm. I mean, after, after God, it's my wife, mm -hmm. not my children. It's my wife, yeah. okay? So God, uh, my wife, family, and then ministry. Mm -hmm. But a lots of times in my immaturity, and I'm still very immature, by the way, yeah. uh, and I still got a lot of growing to do. I make a lot of mistakes. So do I. Oh, so do I. Jesus help me. Thank <laughs> you. Aren't you grateful for forgiveness? Yes. And God's grace? Yes. So anyway, yes. that would be, that would be the, if I was going to tell that person, you know, I would tell the younger Dave, <clears throat> Don't be an idiot. People are gonna leave you. There's only one person that should never leave and that's the person that I committed my life to. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not talking about Jesus when I say that, by the way. We know that. We know that Jesus is never gonna leave us. But I need, I, you need to make your wife priority because Kevin, old oh man, nobody told me, and they're probably, you guys are probably gonna laugh at this, but nobody told me my kids were going to leave. Okay. So Glennis and I were raising our children like they were permanent children. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because nobody told us that they were going to leave. So every conversation, every vacation, all we did in our lives when our kids were smaller surrounded our children. Mm -hmm. as a family we never realized and I, everybody should know that the kids are going to grow up in fact mm -hmm. you probably pray that your kids are growing up right yeah. but if you invest your time effort money around the children the day will come and this is what happened to us the children left and we're like hey who are you I don't even know you. Mm -hmm. So for 19 years, everything was surrounding the children. So yeah. even though we did some, some uh, date nights for her and I, it never clicked that we, I need to be intentional about developing a relationship with my wife not centered around the kids. If we went on a date night together, we talked about the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was about the kids. Yeah. So what happened is we weren't building our life together. We were building our lives around our children. Okay. Does that make does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And uh, so definitely that's that's something that uh, people need to realize. Yeah. Your children are going to leave. Now our kids are still in our lives, very active in our lives. And I learned this from my wife. She came, this is not my terms, this is hers, that you never stop parenting, you just parent different. Yes. yes. Right? Yeah. So I don't know who to give the credit to. I just heard my wife say that. I don't know if somebody else said that, that she heard. But definitely, that is an absolute fact. Yeah, 
We see. never stop parenting. We just parent different. Yeah. So, but not recognizing that these things are going to change. Mm -hmm. When they do leave, when that transition happens, you've got to start, like we actually had to start over again. In order for us to survive mm -hmm. 32 years now, we actually had to be intentional about, oh, Okay, if we're going to stay together, we're going to like to have to start dating again, yeah. getting to know each other again, yeah. likes, dislikes. Even though, I mean, hey, we were in the same house, we were loving each other, we were sleeping with each other, you yeah. know, all of that stuff. Yeah. It's just when kids leave home, the whole dynamics change again. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. So when your kids leave, I don't want to hear that you guys have a problem because I'm telling you in advance. <laughs> right. No, I hear you. I hear you. And, and I agree. I mean, I, I actually, I tell my kids, you know, when, when we sit down for dinner, I tell them, you know, guys, my kids, as you know, are, are young adults yeah. now. Yeah. And, you know, I tell them like us sitting down as a family together, this, this is, this is just for a season, you know, it's just for a this season. Is, you're going to be, you're going to have your own families, yes. you know, but this is a small period in our lives where yes. we, where we do this together. So I realize the same thing that even with my wife, Jody and I, that, that we have to, we have to prioritize our relationship right. outside of our kids. Yes. You know, especially when they're young and there's so much to be consumed with regarding kids and school and responsibilities that it's it's if if you're not careful, it, you can be it can be so easy to neglect your relationship. And then when they leave, then it's like, what what do you have left? You know. Um, so let me ask you. So so you 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 you, ta you talked about some of the adjustments that you that you made you know with first lady in terms of you know uh starting over and whatnot but in in terms of like because you know as a senior pastor there's a lot on your plate you know you have a lot of responsibilities Sometimes, yeah. right and it's not in case people thought otherwise it's not a nine to five job you know definitely not <laughs> <laughs> it's probably closer to a 24 7 than a nine to nine to Ab five absolutely know? so absolutely how, even though i'm not working 24 yeah, 7 yeah yeah uh yeah definitely so, so how did you how were you able to navigate that in terms of still prioritizing ministry, but also at the same time, as you said earlier, making sure that, you know, your wife is not involved? Yeah. Well, I think probably I learned through failure. Okay. And I've, in my, in my failures of not doing it right, the fact that my wife has so much grace and I think this is where a lot of marriages fail mm -hmm. is because one partner it doesn't have to be the female partner, by the way, it can yeah. be reversed, oh, right? Yes. Um, so this is not gender specific, it's yeah. human. It's yeah. just being human. Yeah. For her to have the grace and feeling safe and taking the risk in communicating mm -hmm. uh, her needs and her desires and for me to have the humility to allow her to to talk so so definitely i would i would say of course it's god but her being vocal yeah in love yeah in love like my wife I, it's a unique situation because because where she grew up in ministry she understood some of the dynamics of of ministry yeah she was exposed to it she was exposed yeah. to it yes so i don't think she struggled where some other wives or spouses would yeah. struggle because she understood the commitment yeah and i would say kevin it's equally important for god to speak to the spouse of a person that's going to be called to full-time ministry mm -hmm. as the person that he's calling to lead the ministry. Yeah. My wife is not just a pastor's wife. She is a full-fledged minister, yeah. woman of God, with her own calling and with her own anointing. And I see her as a gift to me. Mm -hmm. and a gift to the ministry mm -hmm. so we're we we have never we have since we've been married at least mm -hmm. we have never been in competition right. Right. any door i can open for my wife i will i will open that door yeah. and i will sit down to yeah. give her an, uh, the opportunity yeah, nice. and i'll give you a, an example recently we were at a conference 
and uh, it was it's a fairly large church and the pastor asked me uh, because we were going to stay over on the Sunday mm -hmm. and he asked me he said can you or your wife speak for us mm -hmm. on Sunday morning mm -hmm. and first of all that is an incredible man of God that he would respect uh, a female mm -hmm. because in ministry today there, there's a lot of problems yeah. yeah okay so man I was just so honored by his character and his willingness to recognize the gift and the calling mm -hmm. not just on like Glennis Burton mm -hmm. but on a female right because there's a lot of problems yeah. when it comes to gender within the body of Christ. Yeah. And, and it, he did not say, can you speak? And if you can't, could your wife? Yeah. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. He said, can you or your wife speak on yeah. Sunday morning? Yeah. And I'm like, oh man, yes, she can. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And Kevin, this, this, to, to speak on these platforms, on certain platforms, any platform, Mm -hmm. is such a privilege mm -hmm. but if given a choice I'm always going to I'm going to lean to offer her first right. right so and some people may be watching and say but but what if God told you no God called us so if you ask me to speak and I'm saying no I'm not available but my wife is you're 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 getting the cream of the crop so, and it's not because she's more vibrant or more anointing, but she's an incredible gift. Right. right. So, I hope that answers the question. It does, it does. And, and, and we may weave into the, I know we're going to talk about the relationship strategies in a bit, but I think this really ties into that, you know, where, and maybe you can speak to that a bit more in terms of husbands. And it could be wives as well. Sure. But, uh, you know, I, I believe that when God calls someone to ministry, it's calling the couple. Oh, absolutely. If not, good luck with that marriage or yeah. that relationship. Yeah. It's probably not going to last. Yeah. That's why if somebody is watching and you feel called to ministry, even if, if you're single and you're not married and you feel called to ministry, man, the pressure that you and the, the, <laughs> the opportunity you have to be successful will, be, will come from who it is that you connect with. So if you feel called to ministry, you just, in choosing a partner, you better make sure that that's the partner for you. Yeah. Because I can't be called to ministry and you're not. Mm -hmm. You know, Glennis doesn't fight with me because I work 18 hours before I go home mm -hmm. or 14 hours. Mm -hmm. She, some Saturdays, she will ask me, hey, how's, what's going on for Sunday? Are you ready? She asked me a lot. Hey, you ready to speak on Sunday? Yeah. And the answer is almost always the same. No, okay. I'm not ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, I, I never feel really ready. Okay. And I understand that some guys may disagree with that, that yeah. you know, but man, I, don't, I never feel ready. So, so she understands, because she understands the dynamic of ministry, if I got to work on a Saturday, she don't get mad. Mm -hmm. She don't get frustrated. We don't fight over because, you know, I've got responsibilities. Mm -hmm. She understands. But if she wasn't a speaker, if she never understood what it means to prepare a sermon. Yeah. Man, it'd be, it, you know what, guys? It, it would be, it would suck to be married to me. It, it's not fun. Because you got to spend a lot of time alone without your spouse yeah so you know that's why i think friendships are so important yeah yeah but the enemy tries to keep us away from friends too okay so okay so n choose choose wisely if you feel called to ministry make sure that you take your time in choosing a partner and make sure that they're called yeah and i, I would imagine it's important to have that conversation you know if you see someone that is there's a potential that we can you know share a life together to say hey you know i just want to let you know that this is this is what god is calling you to you know cause a lot of problems if they don't know yeah. and they get blindsided yeah. by this yeah you know yeah and if somebody tells you 
if you're if you're dating somebody and they they start telling you, I don't ever want to be a pastor's wife. I'm not, you know, I'm never going to be involved in ministry. Well, you should probably reconsider. Take it serious, mm -hmm. because you know, if somebody's telling you they don't want something and you feel called to that, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, but somebody you're marrying somebody don't don't like risk, it's going to create a lot of friction in your home. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So I don't think I've ever asked you this, even privately. Mm -hmm. When you sense God's call to be a pastor, yeah, was was this before First Lady? While you're with her, and and if so, did did she hear that call simultaneously? Like how how did that how did that unfold? Um, I think we we did we heard it differently. Okay. Um, the first time I actually heard God speak to me and told me, and I mean, clearly, like, I mean, you know, not an audible voice. I didn't hear trumpets, you know, <laughs> the I, was, I wasn't that good. <laughs> I wasn't that good. So, but the first time I heard God call me, I was 12, okay. coming home from a youth retreat. Right. And uh, for her, you, you could probably ask her, but she was, she was very young also, and growing up in ministry, you know, she, it was easy for her to, to flow in ministry because she grew up in ministry and she was also called and anointed. I can't tell you about her call and what, you know, I can tell you about her gifts, Yeah. but I, she wouldn't need to answer those questions. Okay. Okay. But, you know, and I'm not saying pastor Kevin, that if your spouse needs to be called to full-time ministry, Mm -hmm. I hope I'm making that clear. Yeah. With, with, yeah. I just want to make sure the audience knows that. Mm -hmm. Like, the Bible teaches us about relationship when it comes to our, our spouses. Again, whether it's to fee, female or to male. Yeah. What we need to ask ourselves is, is this person, can this person walk with me on this journey towards discovering the goodness of God together. You know, my wife said to me last week, she said to me, she said, babe, I am so grateful to God that you're a Christian. Okay. Did you notice what she said? Yeah. She didn't yeah. say, thank God you're the bishop. Yeah. Thank God you're a pastor. Yeah. She said, thank God that you're a Christian. Yeah. Because she said, I don't know how marriages can be healthy when the spouse is not a believer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And before I'm a minister, before I desire to be in a pulpit, I just want to be a Christian, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm supposed to be a Christian before I become a man of God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I think a lot of people want to be a man of God and then yeah. they try to become a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So my relationship with Christ comes first. Now, I don't always prioritize it properly. Mm -hmm. Don't make the mistake of thinking that I got this figured out. But my goal is to make heaven my home. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be a pastor and lose my soul. But many, many pastors, that, that, that happens where, where whether it's moral sin or things <clears> like <throat> that, where, where I'm sure you can say <clears> that, <throat> excuse know, me, being, being around other pastors. So how, how, do, you, how do you ensure that even while being a pastor, pastoring a church, whether big or small, that your priorities first, your relationship with God and being, being a Christian before being a bishop or a pastor. What, right. are, what are some, some, some practical things that, that you personally, you know, intentionally do to, to make sure that happens? I would say number one, Kevin, is, uh, and this is very simple, probably everybody that's watching will be able to answer that, mm. uh, is having a relationship with Christ. I'm a sinner, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you guys hear me? Yeah. Me? Yeah. I'm a sinner. So, so am I. <laughs> and and uh, recognizing that I am a sinner that needed salvation, and I need salvation every single day. Yeah. So having recognizing that my calling sometimes it's very hard for me to separate calling from. Uh, you know, my relationship with Christ, yeah. but understanding that my responsibility is first to Pastor Dave. 
I need to pastor me. Okay. The hardest person in the world to lead is yourself. Yeah. It's right here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know it's so he easy for a person, it's easy for me to hate myself, dislike myself, but still try to pastor you. Yeah. And I think that's so broken and messed up. If I can't lead myself, why should I even expect you to lead, follow me? Mm -hmm. I need to lead myself. So, having a healthy relationship with Christ first, I believe. Uh, however, because of the way God wired me, and you know, I, I listen to guys like T.D. Jakes talk about, you know, having this intimate relationship with Christ outside of the ministry, outside of, yeah. and, uh, outside of who they are as Bishop T.D. Jakes or. Mm -hmm whoever it is that you know you follow yeah. um, sometimes I have a hard time separating the two okay sometimes because it's so much part of who I am and I haven't discovered how to do that yet mm -hmm. and I I want to experience what I hear some other men of God talk about with with regards to having this intimate relationship with Christ but I I don't think I figured it out yet okay outside the context of of full time of, ministry yeah full time ministry okay. okay because but I am concerned about that I'm very concerned because oh here's here's what I'm learning a lot of my self worth comes from my title in fact a lot of benefits that come into our lives come not because of David Burton it comes because I'm Bishop you can almost erase Dave Burton mm -hmm. it come a lot of the, the gifts and the benefits and the blessings that I receive comes because of my position not because of David Burton which is a problem it's very problematic because the bishop is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. Okay, the calling is not because the calling don't disappear, but my position is going to change. Yeah. I am not going to be the lead pastor of the Resurrection Center unless, I mean, if, if Christ should tarry. Right. You understand? I'm going to transition. And if my identity is all about my position as bishop, mm -hmm. if you remove that, I'm going to lose myself. Yeah. So I'm trying to find ways to discover Dave Burton, not Bishop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I need to survive after you're not here. Yeah, yeah. Because, and I, I understand this is not a blanket statement, mm -hmm. but most people in my life, people that love me dearly, and it's genuine love, huh? it's not fake. It's because of who I am in my position, not because of David Burton. Most people will love Pastor Kevin Scott because of the title of the pastor, because what you bring them. Yeah, the gift that you have. The, you correct. Love, you love your gift. And that's not evil, eh? It's not evil. That's just humanity. Yeah, that's natural. It's human natural behavior. Yes. Yeah. So, so you're making the distinction between your self worth. As a as a as a byproduct of what you do versus who you are in Christ. Yes. And I and I find I'll speak as a man. I imagine to, to agree for women as well. But for as men, you know, we we tend to we tend to uh, define our self worth based on our performance. Oh yes. What, what we do. You yes. Know? And then, like you said, when when that stops, so you remove that, then what are we left with? You know. You know. And actually, I had I had a similar. You know, uh, for those of you who weren't aware, I, I, I served as worship pastor for and many years. And you did a great job, by the yeah. way. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You know, when I, when I, when I, when we, tra when we transitioned, I transitioned out of that into a uh, more of a pastoral role. You know, I went through a period where I was, I went through depression. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I, this is all I knew. Yeah. You know, and I, and I kind of merged that into what I did as a worship pastor into this is who I am. And so when that, it was almost like a, it was almost like a part of me died. Yeah. You know? So it's like yeah so but it's part of you did yeah yeah because that's a loss yeah and and oftentimes we try to 
we think transitions and doing things is not a loss. You need to recognize, you know, which is not your case, you weren't fired, but there's somebody watching that probably lost their job last yeah. week. Like that's very traumatic. Yeah. It's trauma, it's a yeah. loss, it's a death. Yeah. So you gotta learn to be able to walk through that grieving process. Yeah. And uh, I, I hear you. Yeah. And I guess the way, the, the, the healthy way to go through that, because like you said, those things happen, right? You they do happen. You can't, through like that's gonna happen, but I guess the way to go through that is, is underneath that, the foundation is, okay, well this is, this is not who I am. The yeah. worship pastor is not who I am. It's what I did. Yes. But who I am is a child of God. Amen. Um, so I, ha I so I now have to always go back to that. Yes. Fundamental principle, revelation based on the word of God that. Yes. I'm a child of God first. Yes. Before I'm a husband, before I'm a father or anything else, before what I'm doing now as an elder, as a leader, is I'm a child of God. You know? Absolutely. Because it, it's so easy. And, I, and we talk about this a lot in our conversations is, man, insecurity is, is, is is such a tool of the enemy, you yes. know? It's for, you know, some people may talk about, you know, money or, or, or sex or things like that, which are real, you know, temptations. Sure. But, but the, I don't know about you, but for me, the insecurity part is, 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 is something that I've gotta be on guard for every day, you know? Because the enemy can use that and, and just attack my own self-worth, you know? I was having a conversation with somebody earlier this morning, and in that conversation, I remember telling them this. I believe even the most secure person has insecurities. Yeah, yeah. Every person has some insecurities. You, it's different levels of insecurity. Yeah. Okay, but I think all of us have insecurities. Yeah. So acknowledging and recognizing what makes us insecure is part of the process of being delivered from that insecurity. Because mm -hmm. I know I have a lot of insecurities, but I'm not going to let my insecurities rule my life yeah right so it's not it's not so much to not have insecurities because that might not be reasonable but it's Correct. to be aware of what they are yes and to be able to manage, manage. and know i think yes. i think also know what 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 may trigger those yes insecurities yes you know? um yes i want to i want to get back to before we move on to going back to the beginning and and past during the resurrection center you know you've you've told this story many times but just for for the viewers you know the vision that God gave you, mm -hmm. you know can you talk about how that came to be how yeah. God gave you the vision that 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 he gave you for for this church yeah well before I ever knew there was even a Montreal West Church of God which was the name of our yeah. former church yeah. um, before I met anybody from here one day I was driving through through a community working I was working at that time and um, I heard the Lord say um, one day I'm going to raise up a church through you I'm going to use you to raise up a church and I'm, I want you to call it the Resurrection Center okay yeah so this before you even knew about before this? before be, before before any of this okay before i ever met you okay. before i ever came to montreal okay i had no idea you didn't tell me in montreal yeah. at this location yeah. none of that you just said i'm one day, one day i'm going to raise up okay. a ministry and i want you to call it the resurrection center okay where dead dreams live again okay okay, okay. so what did at that what did you do with that like other it, than it, the back of my head okay and say okay. At that time, were you were you pastoring somewhere else at, at that time? Were you I was working in a church. Okay. Uh, with with Pastor Regan and okay. at that in that time. Okay. Uh, serving, my okay. life has always been about serving. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So my life has always been about serving. So God said, I. W I'm going to raise it up. I want you to call it the Resurrection Center. Okay. Okay. And uh, and you know, when God gives you a word, so He doesn't. He, he's never told me timing. Huh? Like when God tells me something, you don't say in two years from now this is going to happen. Yeah. I receive the word. I put it in my spirit, and I leave it, mm -hmm. and I continue to work. Yeah. yeah. I don't go out looking for a building. I don't yeah. go start a ministry. Yeah. I continue to serve. Yeah, you don't drop everything. No, and no, no, no. 
Yeah. You get you in a lot of trouble. Yeah. If if you're gonna run your life on prophetic words, hey, you're gonna have a difficult life. Yeah. Because yeah. everybody, you know, depending on the the people that's around you, almost everybody got a prophetic word for you. Right. Right. So I don't I don't move on prophetic words. Mm -hmm. I receive prophetic words, but I don't take actions based on prophetic words unless it's a confirmation of something that God is telling me and there's a specific instruction in the prophetic word. Okay. Okay. That's a whole nother yes. thing. <laughs> prophetic <laughs> yes. words. Yes. 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 So you so you get the vision from God. Yeah. I'm gonna raise up a church through you. You're gonna call it the Resurrection Center where dead yes. dreams live again. And I go back serving yeah. to Pastor Regan. You follow it away, said thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then at some point, and I know this is not the next day, but right. after yes. a while, yes. You so what happens is, uh, you know, we've been serving with Pastor Regan, and he feels he feels that it's time that God wants to open a door for us to go into full time ministry. Okay. So. Uh, and there was some things going on here, and they called um, the overseer, the national moderator for Canada, mm -hmm. was contacted and said, hey, Montreal West Church of God needs uh, somebody to speak on Mother's Day uh, because there was some situation, they had no pastor. So uh, he called Pastor Regan and said, Pastor Regan, do you think Dave would go to Montreal and speak? for the weekend. So he called me and he said, uh, hey, Dave, can you, you, you want to go to Montreal to yeah. speak at this church? Yeah. I'm like, Montreal, can you send me to Africa first? Or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who in their right mind wants to go to Montreal right, right. Uh, at that point? Because I never, I had no desire to go to Montreal. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, all I thought of Montreal was, I don't speak French. Why would, it, why would I go to Montreal? Yeah. Because, anyway, so I, I said, yeah. And he said, you probably, he said, you should go. And at that time, I, was, I thought we were actually going to move to the U.S. Okay. Uh, and we were being, I guess, interviewed. If that's, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interviewed, mm -hmm. considered maybe. We were being considered for a church in the U.S. <clears throat> and uh, that's where I thought we would end up. Okay. So we came here for the weekend. It was Mother's Day. Can you go down and preach for the weekend? I came down and spoke for the weekend, you know, at a great time. Uh, met you guys, a lot younger you. Yes. 19-year-old <laughs> um, me. <laughs> yeah. You know, then uh, the overseer for Quebec Maritimes called and said, you know, do you think you could come back next week? And we're like, okay. So remember, we're... we're we're working with Pastor Regan, plus yeah. we're both working full-time jobs. Right. So we would make the seven-hour trip to Montreal. We stay, we were having Sunday evening service. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we were having church, right? Yeah. So it's not like, oh, okay, you do an hour service and you're out yeah. of there. You know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, we would put our kids back in the car, yeah. drive back six, seven, seven hours, seven plus hours sometimes. Uh, back down to Ontario, Kitchener, and and uh, I would shower and go to work. Okay. Yeah. Back Monday morning. Just back Monday morning. Okay. I had a job. Okay. They didn't care about ministry. <laughs> I had a job. <laughs> yeah. And that job was putting food on my table. Yeah. yeah. So I, we would do that, and then long short long story short, uh, they kept asking us, you guys. The elder board at that point kept asking us to come back. Yeah. So we came six weeks in a row. Uh, now, Kevin, it's 21 years ago, so I might be missing some little details, sure. okay? But it's sure. not, if I'm missing something, it's not intentionally that I'm trying to yeah. deceive or it's, anything it's like that, okay? Years, yeah. It's 21 years yeah. ago. So this is what, what I remember. Six, I think six or eight weeks, we kept coming back. And, and then they're like, uh, the overseer said, uh, they would like, to know if you would consider becoming their pastor. Okay. And I'm like, well, I said, do you see what color I am? <laughs> because at that time, like it was only my two kids and my wife, myself, the only white people in the church, right? Yeah. So I'm like, I, I don't, and, and the overseer said, I don't know how this would work. 
And I don't think he really, I don't think he believed. Okay. 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 I don't think he believed that I would be the one. Because he said, you know, even if you say yes, I'm going to send some other people, uh, which is fine, right? Yeah. It's, all, it's all normal. It's yeah. okay. So I'm like, yeah, what, whatever is fine. Uh, so uh, before I said yes, of course, I'm going to talk to my wife because I want to go to the U.S. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to go to so the U.S. So in the back of your mind, you're still oh, thinking of... Yeah, I want to yeah. go to the U.S. Okay. And, and remember, I, I'm coming, I'm working in the corporate world, yeah. right? And... So corporate mindset is climb ladders, right? So if I do, so, and I, I love people, I love leadership. So I'm thinking, ah, you know what? I talked to my wife and you, you know what? You know what she says? She didn't tell me this. The first time before we came here, so now you got to think about weeks, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Months now. And then, yeah. It's going, it's going by. The Lord woke her up, I think, and she would have to clarify this. Mm -hmm. The same Sunday, the, the Saturday night, yeah, we came down on a Saturday. Before we came, the Lord woke her up and said to her, I'm going to send you there to Montreal to pastor. Not, for me, guys, for me, I never heard a thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nothing. And she wasn't going to tell me. And she didn't. She didn't tell you? She didn't tell me. Okay. She didn't tell me until weeks later. Okay. Because, you know, sometimes when you hear things, even when you feel and know the voice of God, it's like, I don't know, is that me? Yeah. Is that me? Yeah. Is that God? You know? Yeah. And so anyway... We came week after week after week. I'm so sorry it's taken so long. No, that's week fine. after week, we came and, and we said, yeah, sure. If they want to, back then we would vote on our pastors. Mm -hmm. So the congregation would vote if they want somebody. Yeah. So the overseer did present some other candidates. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember that day. Do you? Yeah. 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 You all got, a, all got like a, a ballot? ballot? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Don't tell me who was on the ballot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, that, that week after you guys voted, the overseer said, I don't know how this works, but they want you. Yeah. Yeah. And so that means a career change basically because, you know, for you that it might be boring for some people to hear this because they've heard me say this before. I never wanted to be in full-time ministry. Okay. And I know, I know, I know, guys, I know. I, I get it. I, if I heard a pastor say that, I'd be challenged too. I didn't want to be in full-time ministry, Pastor Kevin, because I was afraid. Okay. Because most of my reference points for full-time ministry is their life is miserable. They are very unhappy. Yeah. And they were very poor. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be poor. Mm -hmm. So, so, but that was my example. Now, not, not Pastor Regan, okay? But Pastor Regan has been doing that for 40 plus years, right? Yeah. But my reference points of even growing up, I was always around pastors, pastors' children. And pastors were not happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were very... I. Even I wasn't grow. I didn't grow up in the home. I could hear arguments because I had friends between husbands and wives. I was like, "Wow, that's really weird." Because I saw them live a life. I see them in the pulpit, but I saw their life, and I thought, "This, this, this seems happen. weird," yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so even though I felt called, I thought, "God, I'm going to do both." Yeah. Right. And you know, us men, we love to figure things out. So. I will do this, God. I will answer your call. I'll, be, I'll do whatever you ask me to do, but I'm going to do both. Okay. Because I thought I was smart enough to do both. Right, right. So when, when that happened, uh, we, we didn't just take a big step of faith. Yeah. We did a leap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I moved my family here two children sold your house sold my house 
I had no backup plan. And now at 55 years old, like I have zero backup plan. Okay. <laughs> Even less so than that. Even now. less. Well, when I came here, I was 32 or 33, something like that, yeah. you know? So, yeah. so I think I turned, turned 33 here, if I remember correctly. But anyway, that don't matter. So, you know, back then, and when I came here, I hope people don't leave the church. Even because I was leaving corporate world to come and do this, I'm thinking, yeah, I'll probably become an overseer. And, you know, I remember in my interview when I was joining the Church of God, somebody asked me, well, what would you like to do with the church, within the Church of God? And I said, uh, oh, I'd like to become the general overseer of the Church of God International. Okay. And he laughed at me so hard. He said, you, you're Canadian. You're, never, you're not going to be. You know, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. <laughs> right. So, but that was my mindset. So I figured, ah, I come here, I maybe, you know, pastor this church maybe for a few years. And then I'll just, I'll just do something different. You mm -hmm. know, there's lots of things to do. There's, in ministry, there's so many needs that people have. Right. And, you know, so I, 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 I didn't come here and with the intention that I'd be here 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the maturity level to think that far ahead. Okay, okay. So I came here because that was the next step. But God did something supernatural. Wow. Yeah, wow. he definitely did something supernatural. Natural. And after a few years, Kevin, all my corporate mindset, and this is very important for people to know, especially if there's a pastor that's watching this. All my corporate mindset, it wasn't that it's not fruitful. It helped me. It helped me a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But God had to remove it. Okay. about it was no longer about next steps my desire to become anything other than the man of God that God called me to be mm -hmm. I he removed all that desire to climb the corporate ladder to become an overseer to I don't what, care about those was things. that a, was that a painful process with like how did that how did that un unfold? You know what? I, I, God is so good to me, it wasn't painful. Okay. And do you know why? Because he made me fall in love with his people. Okay. Okay. You know, when, when God, when your heart changes, it's not hard. Yeah. I hear people talk about it all the time. Oh, people in the church, this, this, this. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Because... It's not hard to work with people when you love them. Yeah. Even broken people, even messed up people. Yeah. Yeah. When you love them, you know. Imagine if if you threaten or decided to leave Jody every time you had a problem. Yeah. yeah. You're you could not have a healthy That's relationship. That's not healthy. That's not healthy. Yeah. And like you said, it takes the right godly heart to be able to see. It's not that there's not behaviors or things like that, but you mistakes, but you, but you see beyond that. And you, see, you, yeah. you see them as God's people. As God's people. And the Lord taught me many, many years ago, these people are not yours. Yeah. Because sometimes we pastors, I think we see the people as ours. Yeah. And when you see anything as yours, do you think you're the owner? Yeah. Yeah. And when you, when you see yourself as the owner, this happens in finances, it happens in companies. When you see yourself as you're the owner, you feel like you have a right to abuse mm -hmm. or misuse mm -hmm. because it's yours. But if I loan, if you borrow, if I borrow your car, I'm going to treat your car better yeah. than I treat my own. Yeah. Well, I can, I can speak to that because I have borrowed your car. <laughs> And and I and I and I and yeah, I've treated better than my own because yeah, because you have a sense of responsibility. You need to return this car yeah. back to the the owner. Yeah. Now, I see the church as God's church. He's put me as a shepherd, and I got to present the church, mm -hmm. God's people. I need to present what He's given me influence over mm -hmm. back to Him. So, am I going to give God something 
lower or not as nice as what he gave me to start with, yeah. I need to treat it right. Yeah, right, right, so stewardship. Yeah, so, but it doesn't mean that I, I don't get frustrated or anything mm -hmm. sometimes, and it doesn't mean that I never misuse the gifts mm -hmm. because I'm still human and my heart is still deceptive and who can know it? Right. So I gotta right. keep my heart before the throne of God. So, you know, I mean, not only in this interview, but throughout, uh, throughout the time I've known you, you've, you've really, you and First Day have always been consistent in terms of talking about the people and how much you love the people. Would you say when you, because I mean, you're, 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 you, you talked about your reference points growing up watching past, so, you, so you're my reference point when it comes to right. pastor. Um, is that, would you say that's the norm? Do you see that with other pastors in terms of that? love for people I, I i would think not but but i don't want to make that a, that assumption is that is that is that so yeah. so let's, you know you know kevin that's something that pastors struggle with in your you know i i believe and i could be wrong okay but i believe many pastors struggle because some people are not nice yeah yeah and Sometimes well, it's yeah. not the pastor. Yeah. Man, people are really broken. Yeah, yeah. And we pastors are broken. Yeah. And if if the people around the pastor, not everyone, but somebody needs to love the Kevin Scott, not the pastor Kevin Scott. Mm -hmm. Some people God needs. To bring some people around that pastor that love the person not the gift mm -hmm. and I do believe just through God's grace and mercy and his love for us he's given us some of that mm -hmm. and sometimes it's, we're not talking ten people we're not talking it doesn't need sometimes it only takes one or two people yeah, yeah. but these one or two people must be influential because if you don't have any influence, the fact that you that you love the Dave Burton, not the Bishop Burton, won't matter. Mm -hmm. But you need to have some people around you that love Kevin Scott for Kevin Scott, not because of what he does oh, yes. or what he brings to the ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of pastors, for whatever reason, I, I, I have some thoughts why, but I don't think that would really matter. The reason, but I think a lot of pastors can't survive because of that. Okay. Sometimes it just takes one, one person. You maybe somebody watching right now mm -hmm. that you could make you could be the difference in your pastor staying for twenty plus years or thirty years, forty years in that ministry. Just one person could make mm -hmm. the difference mm -hmm. because there is no way that the whole church, the whole church, the whole congregation is going to love the pastor yeah yeah they don't even know the pastor yeah some people only see me one hour standing in a pulpit that, that's it they have no relationship they've never had a conversation with me so they don't know me mm -hmm. I didn't stay for them we didn't stay for them mm -hmm. we stay for the people that God called us to, mm -hmm. and is that how you, is that how you um, you deal with situations where, like you said, not everyone's going to love you or agree with what you do? Is it really come back to, you know, I'm I'm here, I'm focusing on the people that God has called me to, and I have, God hasn't called me to everyone. Is is that, is that yeah. where 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 you come back to? I I think in order to survive, you you got to tell yourself that, yeah, but. It doesn't mean that you don't feel pain. Oh, for sure. For sure. You understand? For sure. But you just you just understand. You just got to get to a place where you accept the fact. Not everybody's going to love you. Yeah. In fact, some people are going to hate you. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, "In this life, you're going to suffer persecution." Yes. You're going to have trials, you're going to have temptations, you're going to have disappointment. Mm -hmm. Kevin, 
every person will have disappointments. And it's not all Satan, it's not all demonic. Yeah. It's called L-I-F-E. Yeah. It's life. And it doesn't necessarily have, have to have anything to do with you? No. It doesn't. So, it's life. That some of the things that I go through, every person watching this goes through the same things. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're living a life like I'm living a life. Yeah. So we all have, we all have problems. We all have difficulties. We all have relationship issues. You know, we all have struggles within our marriage, within our family. Kids are crazy. No matter if they're in the church or out of the church, kids are going to do things that are not the wisest thing. And... You know, you look back over your life and you would think, oh, I was never that stupid. Oh, you were. You're, you were just that dumb. You've done some pretty <laughs> dumb stuff too. Yes. Oh, yes. So, yes. Yeah. you know, but ultimately we've got to remember that we, our lives don't belong to us. It belongs to Christ. And he is ultimately in control. Mm -hmm. The goal, Kevin, the goal, ladies and gentlemen, is this. I need to make heaven my home. So this comes back to being a Christian first. <laughs> yes. If you're not a Christian first, these things, life can, can really can destroy you. It does. Yeah. And it, can, it, it wrecks you. And you're going to, you know, because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to have any pain. And if you're, on, if you're called to ministry, the enemy wants to make sure that your pain is too full. Yeah. yeah. You know? But uh, you're, you're going to suffer. He has an assignment. Mm -hmm. And his assignment is not just always to destroy your soul. But his assignment is to make sure that you never fulfill purpose. Mm -hmm. Because Kevin, Pastor Kevin Scott's purpose is to extend the kingdom of God. So my faith and my salvation is sealed in Christ. No matter what he does to me, I believe I'm sealed in Christ. It doesn't mean I'm not saying I can't backslide. Yeah. But I believe that whatever he does to me, worst he could do is send me to heaven. Yeah. And sometimes, I don't know why, but it seems like he can send some of us to heaven earlier than what we really should. Yeah. Okay? So that's the goal. The goal is to get to heaven myself. And the next part is to take as many people as I can to heaven with me. Yeah. When I get to heaven and I stand before Christ, I want to be able to present to him some gifts. Yeah. 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 So, and, and there's no greater crown that you can place at the feet of Jesus than the soul winner's crown. To present somebody, somebody needs to make heaven be, mm -hmm. because of Dave. Yeah. Man, can't wait to get there to see if I got any reward or not. Yeah. Yeah. So... I hope that helps. Yes, yes. So anyway, I, we're, we're here and, you know, we came and we, we were committed and the people loved us. And love we you. loved, yeah. 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 But I think that was a supernatural love that only God pleases. And I think that comes through calling. When, when you go somewhere where God calls you, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have any problems, mm -hmm. but God will surround you with some people that's going to love you and I could, I'm sure that I could find some negative things to say about the people at RC if I look for them. Yeah. And you'll find something if you look for it. Yeah. But I'd rather look at the love that they have. Not for us, because that, I've said that a few times, yeah. the way we are loved. Yeah. But the reason behind or why, why they love us is because the love of God in their heart. Yeah. I do not have a capacity to love anybody outside of the love that I've received from Christ. Yeah. I can only love you. So if you, if you feel honored with, with something that I'm doing for you or the love that I express to you, ultimately you need to be able to understand and see that that love comes from the love that they receive. No man can give love without they receive the love of the Father. Yeah. So when, and, and this is in every aspect of our lives. So the love that RC receives from us, whatever that looks like, I can't be the judge of that. But if they receive any kind of love, 
it is because I've received the love of the Father. Because Dave outside himself, I don't know if he has zero, I, I'm not sure about that. Because I think maybe we have a little bit of love that we can give as a human being. But the love that sustains, that keeps, that forgives, is, comes from the Father. Yeah. It doesn't come through the human, it comes through the Spirit. It comes through the divinity, it comes through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's... And, and sometimes people won't be able to see. Sometimes I can't see that. I, ex I, I equate the love as, oh man, Kevin really loves me. Mm -hmm. And I forget the only reason Kevin can express any kind of love or have love in his heart towards anybody, towards Jody, his kids, comes from the Father. Yeah, yeah. Hate comes from Satan. Yeah, yeah. However that looks. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, we can go on and on. We could. Yeah. <laughs> I want to I want to transition to you know the vision that God gave you for this church and how that has unfolded to to today you know 21 years later um, but let me I want to start with the vision God gave you which which is which is a longer document but really it centers around dead dreams live again yes can you can you elaborate on that what is what does that mean okay that actually came from I think it was three or four o'clock maybe two o'clock I don't remember I did record it yeah. Uh, that the Holy Spirit woke me up one morning. Why I was here? This didn't happen. Yeah. Why, why I was here, why we were going through some transition. And he said, get up. And I'm like, no. <laughs> okay. No, he said, I want you to get up and write something. I didn't hear, get up and write, we have a dream. Mm -hmm. I, I heard him say, get up, I want to I wanna talk to you. And he said, I want you to write. So I, I wrote what he said. And of course, it stems from if you read we have a dream you you can look at uh martin luther's king's we have a dream, have a dream speech, speech yes. you yes. know and it seems similar but uh that's just the way god works with me i didn't i didn't take it from there and say hey, i'm gonna make it sound like this yeah. it wasn't really premeditated that's what i heard yeah. and through working through the document we have a dream is what 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 i called it and then it went through i don't know it feels like you know a book of what God, what I heard God say yeah. um, about what he would create at, through the Resurrection Center. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite extensive. It's on the internet if anybody wants yes. to, to, to read it. Yes. And we have certainly tried to redefine this over yeah. time. Because one thing you got to understand about having vision, we need to continue to submit the vision that God gave us to refine it. It doesn't mean that the original document is the only document. Remember, that's not the Word of God. Yeah. We don't get to change the Word of God. Yeah. We can change vision. Mm -hmm. We adapt to vision. Vision, we, in fact, I believe it's necessary to adjust things. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, and we have definitely done a lot of that over the years. But the core of everything has not changed. I mean, we don't say resurrection center where dead dreams live again. And and the reason where dead dream comes, uh, where dead dreams live again, where that comes from, is that the Lord was showing me that every person has a dream that He has placed in their heart, mm -hmm. and most of those dreams lay dormant or they die. Yeah, yeah. And the anointing on this house is to help people to allow them to be empowered to cause these dreams that have died could be business could be relational it could be education some of us just need somebody to come alongside us to say hey i see this in you yeah. so you know with regards to raising up uh, a ministry what I felt the Lord was saying I want you to I want to raise up a ministry that will take people from birth to the grave right. right okay so give birth to I mean babies babies literally babies being yeah. born within the ministry and and they don't need to leave that ministry to have their spiritual needs met yeah. so you know cause them and treat them in a manner where the purpose of God are, is fulfilled through every stage of their life till they come to the end of their life. Right. right. So, so that's, and you know, I'm not going to get into all the different points of 
of the vision, yeah. but we definitely want to be a place where people feel loved and accepted mm -hmm. and feel safe. Mm -hmm. The church from a lot of people is the only place where they feel love. Yeah. yeah. Even in, even if they're married, sometimes even in a marriage and a relationship from family members, they don't feel love. So when people come to RC, I want them to feel love. Yeah. Yeah. The love of Christ that flows through Kevin Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've see, even seen that throughout the pandemic. You know. Yes. Which I don't. We won't go into in depth because that's that's a whole. Yeah. <laughs> session. And it's getting own. a little old now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, what, one thing that that sh probably it didn't show. I think we knew that, but it reinforces how important it is for the, for the. For the church yes to that place where for many people it's the only place where you where you receive love yeah it's yeah. true yeah community yeah yeah but that's the way god designed us yeah yeah yes so 21 years a bishop what would you say from just from a ministry ministry perspective as pastoring what is what has changed from I guess 2002 until till now. What has changed? And 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 just as a part B to that question, what has changed in a way that you that you would have never expected? Oh well, definitely the one thing that have changed that I would have never expected is the importance on online having an online presence. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. 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 And I mean, 20 one years, years ago, ago yeah. I had no idea yeah. that this was going to take place. And I'm not talking about COVID. Yeah. COVID just sped things up, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, like the importance of online and, and the different way of ministering to people today, I think it's changed. Mm -hmm. I never, I definitely never thought that we would see a time when people didn't come to church. Mm -hmm. And again, people probably think I'm referring to COVID, but I'm not referring to COVID. No, but again, the COVID may have accelerated Correct. that, but that was, yeah. that predates COVID. Yeah. So I, I thought that, you know, believers today would always be committed to the thing that Christ died for, which was yeah. the church. Yeah. And and that's what we grew up to see. Correct. You yes. Know? Yes. You know, so, even, even myself, I mean, it was common that my friends that I went to school with, we, we went to church. Yeah. I mean, for my kids going in school now, it's... it's yeah, they friends. don't see anybody from church there. No. No. Yeah. So no. it's very different. Yeah. 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 And in terms of, you know, for, for me, one thing that I would say that has, that has evolved over the 21 years is, is going back to the vision in terms of the clarity. Some of the things that we put in place to really be clear in terms of what we do as a, as a ministry. Right. You know, we talked about our vision, which is, which, which is long, but we're working on, on refining that. We you know, but also, you know, we have, we have a clear mission, yeah. you know, which is the way that we fulfill our vision, which is to empower every person to yes. love, connect, and serve, which if you are here on Sundays, you've heard that yes. a, a, a time or two. Yes. And we have our process, which is guiding people through, through discipleship, you know, so I, I think we do a great job of, of, of defining what we do and making it clear right. that, yes, ultimately the goal is for you to get to heaven, but we have steps. In we place. have steps. To, to make that happen. Yes. You know. Yes. And definitely, Kevin, I mean, God has given us some people at RC to help us work through those things and to refine it. I'm more of a big picture guy. Yeah. I'm not, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not the guy, like you, you're, you, you have a gift at making things clear. Uh, I get bored really fast. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's why God's got to give me some people like you, Amen. like Michael, yes. Uh, yes, that can take that can take what God deposits and refine it and make it simple. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think I make things very complicated. You think so? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Probably because I some I I find it hard to understand in my own head sometimes. So, yeah. yeah. But then I but I think that's where. It, it's important for, for any senior leader, it could be a pastor, it could be CEO, to have the right people to be able oh my to gosh. take that and interpret it and, and, and sometimes yes. decode it, you yes. know, and say, okay, this is what I'm hearing. Maybe this is how, how it should look. You know? I'm not saying this because I see myself as successful at all, okay? 
but any level of success that anyone experiences, they're going to experience it because of the people that's around them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes Definitely. it takes the people around us yeah. to help us to become successful. I don't believe anybody comes becomes successful by themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's possible. So I don't believe in no. you know what sometimes people say. This one is a self-made millionaire and stuff yeah. like that, or a self-made man. I don't believe any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe any success can be traced back to a relationship. Yeah, yeah. 